Um, uh, we're now uh, live on uh, HowlRound. I don't know. We should uh, pick that up to make sure we're going. Here we go. We're going to experience a little bit of a delay, and I'm going to make sure that we don't hear it on this end. Uh, so because now people are watching uh, at home as we're feeding to everything, I wanted to make sure that um, uh, that we hit a couple of things of, of introduction. Uh, as um, We're Toaster Lab? Yep. Hello? Hello. Um, we had intended to be live mm -hmm. uh, and do this in partnership. We continue to do it in partnership, but in partnership in person with uh, the Festival of Live Digital Art in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, that's also gone online, and we recommend checking out their, their full program. That's um, all the performance is about to come up over the course of this next week. They've been doing the startup. Um, we've been also tangentially involved in one of the large projects that's a collaboration between them and the National Art Center um, that is uh, called The Green Rooms, uh, which is about imagining theater and climate change, which has also moved online. And through tangentially, we're also helping with doing things around carbon footprinting around that. Um, I wanted to do, uh, a, like, sort of address a couple of things uh, before we start uh, uh, talking uh, about the, the things that we have on our agenda and update of the projects that we've been doing. We can do a little round of introduction. You'll see um, every, uh, each of our advisory board members um, uh, that uh, has been joining. We've just come out of a closed meeting where we've been doing updates on our projects, the projects they've been working on and sort of aligning what we're doing. We've had to do this this pretty strong pivot. Uh, I, I want to do, you know, first a few acknowledgements and we're going to jump into, we're going to actually go to um, our advisory board member, Sydney, to talk a little bit about future events first, the topic that we didn't really get to cover too much of in our closed meeting um, about how we pivot around this component uh, what we're doing now in our um, in our future convenings, because this is meant to be our halfway point, three of six. Uh, though everybody is sort of spread out at this point, I did want to recognize that um, we're we are here in Toronto, uh, which has been taken care of by the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Heron Wendat, and the Metis. Uh, and there's many Indigenous people that continue to to call this place home. Um, we also want to make sure that we uh, we state our our solidarity with uh, Black Lives matter and the crisis that's going on right now um, and working in an anti-racist way uh, to support those who are protesting and fighting for black lives in this time of overlapping crises. Uh, I am, uh, for those who are looking at me right now, I'm a white male in Canada in a tenured faculty position. Uh, I don't get a lot more privileged uh, than that. I benefit from a lot of significant systemic and, and institutional uh, privilege, but I also see um, part of my responsibility in holding this privilege as a way to work as an ally for those who do not benefit from this privilege or have uh, experienced oppression as a result of this privilege. Toaster Lab's work is about revealing the hidden stories of place to support uh, mutual understanding, to lift up histories that are being erased. And the Atelier is about boosting projects to make storytelling of this kind, especially with regards to technology, mixed reality technology, um, accessible and to break down barriers for artists to engage with them in allied collaboration with the diverse communities. And you can um, see that in the number of the different projects that we've uh, had the opportunity to collaborate with and some of the ones that we'll talk today. And we also want to acknowledge that we are coming to you on uh, Zoom and Facebook right now. Uh, and while uh, both have become much more important to connecting people um, uh, when we're not able to gather together, uh, both uh, reinforce syst uh, systemic issues in society. Zoom's concern for its users and their security and safety has been critique for long before the current pandemic. And uh, it's uh, recently made statements that put uh, profits up ahead of security by publicly stating that it will cooperate with police and not encrypt communication for unpaid accounts, which is uh, uh, an issue uh, that, that we see in Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has recently uh, abdicated responsibility for false information posted to the company's platform, despite the issues that have uh, caused uh, it, this has caused in dividing society, interfering in elections and virtually spreading false information. Um, so uh we critique society and we also participate here we are um all of us together on these shared platforms 
um, as we're as we're uh, starting up, um, because we're not able to gather right now, what I actually wanted to do, because he can't join us for the entire time, and and right now, unfortunately, his uh, his video is is uh, frozen with me. So, Sydney, are you there? Sydney, known for his hair, is touching his hair. Well, if Sydney's able to join us again, what I want to talk about is some of our future events that are happening. Um, our uh, our fall event. Oh, you're back, Sydney. Um, our our few our fall event was uh, is meant to happen with uh, partners at uh, Indiana University uh, related to a project that we're doing there, which is actually currently delayed in so far as being able to actually be there. Uh, and our winter gathering is meant to be in partnership with uh, the conference on research and choreographic interfaces, which is directed by our friend Sydney Sky Better and board member. And I want to, if you could say a couple of words about um, about how you see that happening in the future, um, knowing that this is all very new and we will not hold you to any of this. Um, I appreciate the lack of accountability, Ian. Thank you. Um, so uh, first, I have to say it's uh, a pleasure and privilege to be uh, joining you all today. Thank you, Ian, for um, uh, and Toaster Lab for indeed holding uh, space and court. Um, and I'm just really, uh, it's always a, a pleasure to see all of you uh, nerds. Um, so um, indeed, uh, in March, tentatively in March uh, of next year, um, the Conference for Research on Choreographic Interfaces, or CRC for short, uh, will be convening question mark in some way to be determined um, at or through or beyond Brown University. Um, the uh, current dates for that uh, event are March 5th through 7th, um, though this too can be subject to change. Um, CRC, um, if you're um, uh, understandably not familiar, is a, is a convening that uh, seeks to foreground uh, the contributions of, of artists, um, body-centric, um, uh, choreographic artists specifically, um, to uh, foreground their efforts to uh, work with and intervene in emerging technologies. Um, it started out with a, a principal preoccupation with uh, interface and interfaciality, um, but is now, um, per the zeitgeist, deeply involved in questions of uh, surveillance um, and statist violence. Um, so this is to say that we will be, um, of course, uh, contending programmatically on some uh, to be determined level with questions of um, of, of Black Lives Matter, of, of our COVID and post-COVID moment. Um, I also say. We will also be screening in some to be determined capacity. Um, one of what I, I assume is one of Ian's favorite films, uh, Johnny Mnemonic, um, which uh, while not a good film is a usefully bad film. Um, other than that, uh, we are currently very um, sort of open and still uh, figuring out indeed what the programming will consist of. Um, we anticipate some manner of speakerly discuss just discursive kinds of programming um, like uh, this. Um, but we are also very open to suggestion here. Um, so I'm very curious um, what uh, folks, how folks want to engage in variously embodied or disembodied fashion. Um, and I uh, am very accessible and interested in, in hearing from you nerds and experts uh, about what is useful and interesting to you. Um, so for more information, uh, check out choreotech.com or ping me personally. And um, Ian, is there anything else that you'd like me to uh, ramble about uh, right now? Uh, I think that's excellent. Thank you, Sydney. We'll can, as, as we uh, intend to uh, continue to support that, we'll also have information coming out through Toaster Lab as well as anything gets sorted. Um, I think that's that, that sort of like openness is something that we're all living with right now. And I think that um, you were very kind in your characterization of my relationship to uh, 1995's Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I'm sad. Sorry, I, I, I didn't quite hear you. Did you say uh, accurate and completely correct? I, I couldn't quite hear you. <laughs> um, you accurate. You went in and out. Yes, yes. Let's go with you. Right, okay, great. Thank you. Um, I did want to acknowledge in checking the stream that um, uh, we have two people who, uh, for, for uh, or three people for various reasons, who are um, have their video off in our call right now. Um, because of the things that they're doing. Uh, but Jacob needs Vicky, Paul Sejus, and Megan Burner are also with us. Um, uh, but uh, because of the way that we stream out of Zoom, we're not necessarily available on the live feed. So you might hear their voices uh, coming up later. Um, it is, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Sydney. 
uh, Sydney, we know that um, everybody is sort of, is dealing with a variety of things, uh, including third grade math. Uh, so if you would like to return to your uh, uh, lesson and demands at home, uh, we really appreciate the time that you've been able to share with us today. Thank you all. So to, to give us a little bit of context for um, how uh, what we want to cover in the remaining time that we have uh, this afternoon, if you're here with us in the Eastern time zone or from wherever um, you join us, is the first thing that uh, we want to do is make sure that we plug a couple of other events that um, were all meant to happen in rapid succession over the course of a couple of days with each other, um, but now are happening over the course of a couple of weeks to allow for flexibility, um, given everybody's uh, strange demands on their time and things that are going on. Uh, we do have a hackathon coming up, uh, which we have uh, labeled Timor, which is Toaster Lab Mixed Reality Performance Hackathon. And we put it into initials and I sort of went with it. Uh, so we're calling it Timor. It's going to start on uh, uh, about this time, uh, the noon hour on uh, Saturday, June 13th. Uh, it will run, uh, which will have a kickoff event then. Uh, there will be a few different scheduled points for participants throughout that, but a lot of it is going to be self-organized as we learn how to do a remote hackathon uh, with support from uh, our friend Julie Driver from Artifact VR, um, who has a, a bit more experience in figuring that out, luckily, uh, than, than we do. And we'll be doing final presentations of the projects that emerge from that that following Friday on June 19th. Uh, all of those are available on our website. So if you go to toasterlab.com slash atelier or click the atelier link, you'll see that all of our events there, including the archive of our previous symposia, uh, and that the, the most current one, which uh, labels it as Folda slash Hellround, which is how we're doing it, getting most of this out this time, um, will have the links to those. We'll also broadcast them there and onto our Facebook page. Um, however problematic we've identified that to be. We also have a special performance and we'll talk about the actual uh, project in a moment. Uh, that's a collaboration uh, that uh, has come together in these COVID times uh, with our partners, Dancing Earth, uh, with whom we were working on the Groundworks project as we've presented about before in working remotely together. And we've got a couple of things to share about that in a moment. Um, before we get into our updates on our boosted projects, uh, which we'll hear um, from those of us here in the home office, literally our home office. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit, uh, we'll turn it over to Adrienne Mackey in Philadelphia in her home office uh, uh, regarding updates uh, to uh, trail off and the project we've been collaborating on there, which we heard a bit with. And we'll acknowledge uh, some of the projects that we've had to rethink what we're doing and delayed and sort of how that affects what we're doing. Um, we've had a good check-in before this. Uh, once we're able to do the updates, the remainder of our time will be spent in discussion with the board, talking about the various opportunities and challenges, um, reflecting upon what we've shared with each other and what we know is coming forward, uh, and talk about what our, our thoughts are towards the future plans of the utility of the Atelier. We've got another year that we're uh, intended to be working in this way specifically through um, the generous support of the Canada Council for the Arts, um, but that doesn't mean that work stops because of that. Uh, so we know that a lot of projects are pushing forward and we're thinking about how we can continue to support that. Yeah. Anything you want to add? No. No. Um, all right. So to give everyone an update towards where we are on uh, a current slate of boosted projects, which we've been actively working on uh, since our last symposium in uh, February, to give some more context insofar as how we work, uh, we've been working in cohorts of three to four projects, roughly spaced out every four months. Uh, projects, uh, we go through a process of boosting those projects, which is to say that we add supplementary uh, human, physical, financial, sometimes resources as we're able to, primarily um, bringing in expertise and some equipment uh, to allow uh, projects to explore uh, mixed reality approaches to production that they might otherwise not have before. And even if they have access to the technology, because um, we do prioritize accessible technology, um, providing the expertise to help them work through those, those processes of integration so that um, we can effectively create a bit of a field, which um, 
our experience in this crisis time, well, the pandemic crisis time, not to um, not to put that crisis above any other crisis happening in this very moment, uh, has been to pivot to online work, which has be, made a lot of what we're doing seem that much more important um, and vital to this moment to be able to share different ways of working remotely. Um, this is the topic of our upcoming hackathon is working in remote work in low bandwidth areas. Um, so we can continue to deliver experiences there when you're not in dense, highly infrastructured areas or have specialized advanced equipment um, that might be out of out of uh, out of uh, reach. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do a screen share here to give you a little bit of uh, to go with this update. Um, don't fail me now. So we should be seeing now um, my uh, my second screen here. Uh, what we the one of the projects that we did in which we started to build uh, augmented reality assets in a few different ways was a production of Oh What a Lovely War, which happened at Heart House here in Toronto. It's a project that we began uh, speaking with the director Autumn Smith over the previous summer when she wanted to bring in a video game aesthetic to the project that she was working on as we started to talk about perhaps supplementing it. It turned into actually a centerpiece of the project as we were working through it. So you can see a couple of the, um, you can see a couple of the um, shots from some of our early experiments uh, uh, working in creating a, a character that we could use through augmented reality. We've got this one dancing from it right here. It, it, it may be, uh, it's been one of our, our favorite things to just make this character, this John Bull character, favorite? which <laughs> it's been entertaining it has. <laughs> uh, to make this John Bull character. This is all done through our, exis uh, our existing Adobe um, uh, sub subscription, um, uh, working with some of their AR tools uh, and being able to bring them onto our phones. Uh, we ended up not wanting to necessarily work with this in the actual production. You'll see also on the right-hand side of the screen there, um, one of the things that we found in uh, post, uh, now that uh, Apple and many other manufacturers have had um, depth sensing ability, especially in their forward-facing cameras, if you have a, ca uh, a phone that is able to do, or it requires you to do uh, face ID and face unlocking, um, one of the ways that it does that is for they're looking at the, 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 the um, uh, the shape of your face and the sort of unique patterns there. What this also opens up the ability is to do facial motion tracking within the phone itself. Uh, so we explored a couple of different programs, ending up working primarily through real illusions programs, um, creating a character through um, through uh, their character creator, um, in which we were able to then animate through their live face program, which uses a network connection to your existing device, um, and then exporting the video from there. Um, oftentimes, they're using it for animation. But for ours, um, we ended up creating uh, this floating head, the presence of John Bull, um, which we ended up putting onto a green background so we could move them around in a keyed way inside uh, an, um, uh, a more familiar uh, uh, video server, this, in this case, using Watch Out. So you can see some of the work um, and the motion here. And the character through, um, uh, through um, that work was uh, shared um, on various parts uh, throughout the entire video design, which ended up becoming a core part of the, the overall scenography of that piece as well, and was played uh, by the director, actually. Um, played by Autumn herself, where we pitch shift her voice um, after doing motion capture with her, so it's matched to each other. Uh, so that's a project that we're working on documentation for. We'll talk a little bit when we get towards the end of, um, of sharing where we are with the various projects about what our steps forward are um, and the focus on documentation there. Another project that we've done that is actually going to be, uh, we're going to be doing a large, uh, a, our final public presentation, at least for the time being, on June 18th is uh, a collaboration with Dancing Earth on Indigenous Futurities, Dancing Earth and Cyberspace. Uh, it is, they were set to tour with a piece that um, some of it originated out of uh, our 
our long-term collaboration on Groundworks, they were had created a, a piece that was a little bit more Southwest oriented uh, called Between Underground and Skyworld. Uh, and it can't tour anymore. And so in having some early conversations about what are the options for, for what we can do and seeing people turn to Zoom, uh, we started to look at how we could use Zoom or go beyond Zoom as a performance aesthetic so that we could create a live performance that works together. So the image that um, we're sharing on the screen right now is meant to look like Zoom, but uh, we're actually using primarily Skype because Skype will allow you to use the video feeds as NDI inputs, network uh, network devices, and uh, using an open broadcast system or OBS studio, you can pull each of those individual video feeds in together. So we've actually um, been able to provide each of the performers with a green screen, uh, relatively affordable hack, and work with the devices that they have available to them to bring in um, a chroma keyed live performance through uh, through Skype that they're, they're performing. And so while we're able to create the Zoom aesthetic as well, and we sort of start there because that's what people have come to expect, we've also started to do live uh, compositions that bring in pre-existing video ad sets from the show, being able to scale and have people appear on screen together and re in response to each other in different configurations, not just locked into their Zoom boxes that we're, as we're used to. Um, we've brought in the ability to integrate text. One of the features that will be integrating into the show is um, a, a, essentially a, a, a Facebook chat uh, that we're able to bring into the performance as well so that those who are watching it um, uh, and, a, and a group of people that we're working with ahead of time will be able to add uh, comments within a, sp a specific topic. We can invite people that are in the audience each time to submit that, uh, videos and photographs as well that, that work into the compositions. So I just have one more. And these are a number of different screenshots that we have. And the artists that are participating in this, as I stop to share my screen, uh, so we were back to our typical, uh, 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 because of our, back to our typical Zoom layout. Um, one of the things, uh, so the artists that we have here are spread across uh, uh, Turtle Island in the Pacific, uh, both in where they are right now and the origin. Uh, um, with artists coming from Minneapolis, Seattle, Albuquerque, Phoenix, and uh, well, within the, the the greater area of Wellington, New Zealand. Um, and so everything's timed up in such a way so that everybody is performing live uh, together with um, this home office, which you see us coming from right now, serving as a control room that it all comes into Toronto and then goes back out live. Um, from here, so those are those are a couple of the the core the core Toaster Lab projects that we've been focusing on the last couple of weeks as we've been doing this. I wanted to turn it next to Adrian to give a little bit of up, uh, uh, update around how Trail Off has been working in Philadelphia. Sure thing. Um, so for um, anyone on the stream who doesn't know a ton about the background of Trail Off, it's a mobile app that is a collaboration between Toaster Lab my company, Swim Pony, and the Pennsylvania Environmental Council, or PEC. Um, and the aim of the project, it's been um, like two years of active work, um, sort of three, if you count, like a long conception. We did a very extensive um, kind of fun research process where we did a series of workshops sort of looking at geolocative storytelling um, leading up to the actual production. Um, but the aim of the project is really to increase the diversity of narratives that we associate with natural spaces. So the core conception of the project is 10 trails throughout the Philadelphia region um, that have been selected by 10 authors who went through a very extensive um, community engagement intake process, um, all of whom self-identify in some way as um, marginalized from the environmental space. So these are not the audiences that are currently being effectively served by environmental programming. Um, they came in, um, took part in sort of like a few months of dialogue and dramaturgy with us, did an extensive workshop um, that Justine was at um, back in March of 2019. Um, and then spent around six months um, kind of in residence uh, on their trail, getting to become the master of uh, all the different nooks and crannies of it. Um, and then wrote original 
um, stories, whatever that means to them. In some cases, those were autobiographical uh, or historical inspired. In some cases, they were original fiction works. In some cases, they were original epic poems that span the landscape, but all in relationship to the actual environment uh, that you see as you walk along the trail. Um, so once the authors created those scripts, uh, we took them and then um, uh, sound designer and composer Mike Kiley and I worked together with over a hundred um, performers, um, actors and musicians to do the epic task of translating these scripts into actual audio dramas. Um, it was a, I don't know that we knew this when we got into it, but it was essentially creating like 10 full length produced um, theater pieces um, with original music uh, on brand new scripts and all the dramaturgy that goes with it um, in a recording of about three months period, um, which I don't highly recommend to anybody on the planet to do ever again. <laughs> um, but the works um, honestly are just as astonishing um, pieces of literature. They're incredibly beautiful and incredibly um, they range in, in both being incredibly funny and poignant, um, incredibly moving, incredibly provocative. Um, I've been reading many of them over in the past week and just struck how much these authors are really speaking to the crisis that's happening in this moment and that the, the stories that they're sharing really are the ones we need to be hearing, particularly right now. Um, after we recorded the works, um, Mike went away and created uh, some incredible um, 3D sound design using binaural audio techniques um, in conjunction with both his own composition and music that we captured um, from artists uh, that were identified as part of the process for pieces that had like particularly culturally sensitive music. Um, and then put all of that work into a visual design that was um, headed up by Maria Shafflin with some assistance from Vanessa Oboihi, who um, put it all into sketch and handed it off to Andrew, uh, who has been just like an incredible wizard when it comes to actually translating this into something that's actually going to um, be a real thing that people use out on the trails. Um, our hope, uh, and I have deep faith and excitement um, that the experience is really gonna feel like um, honest to God, immersive theater for one person whenever they want to do it. Um, that it'll be a, ge a geolocative piece that syncs to the user as they walk and that you'll really feel held and carried in these amazing worlds, um, both in the technology and in the creative content. Um, uh, as I was saying earlier in our meeting, um, tomorrow would have been the official launch had we been on the original timeline. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think the project will actually benefit from a little bit of extra space. Um, we're gonna be connecting with Fringe Arts here in Philadelphia for the new launch in September. Um, we're gonna have a whole series of um, extra corollary digital programming, everything from authors live streaming themselves walking the trails and talking about how they created it to some environmental justice panels, um, some behind the scenes, hopefully on tech, Toaster Lab uh, would love to have you guys involved in that too, um, as we sort of share the process of how this piece has gone. Um, it's a big, 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 big thing. Um, and it's really exciting to see it finally coming pretty close to close. I think that's Thank it. Adrian. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you so much. I'm gonna update on a couple other projects that we've been working on um, that are basically uh, on hold indefinitely, um, but we're still trying to make the most of this time. Um, and that was one of the things we talked about uh, in our closed um, AGM before this presentation is how do you make the most of this time where you can be a little bit more reflective and slow down and try to see the positives in it. Um, a couple of years ago in 2018, Toaster Lab worked with uh, the Parkway Forest Park community in Toronto. Uh, we, through the Toronto Arts Council Arts in the Parks program, received a grant to do a VR filmmaking workshop for youth uh, who lived around that area. And it was wonderful. And they uh, produced a wild array of content that we then happily embedded in a um, web app that was geolocated their content, their their little films throughout the Parkway Forest Park area. Happily, 
um, we received a grant to do that again. Um, and we've been working with the Toronto Arts Council to redo the timeline for that project essentially. And that's been a big, I think a big part for a lot of the folks that are we've been chatting with um, here and elsewhere who are working in this way is how do we change the timeline to um, make the art even better? And that's, I think, what Adrian was talking about a little bit too. Uh, so for Parkway Forest Park, we can't obviously uh, offer a workshop for children right now in a park. Um, and so what we're doing uh, right now instead is refining the curriculum that we would offer um, in light of any COVID-19 restrictions once community centers and parks open up again in Toronto and um, how, how much comfort we feel with offering that sort of uh, experience and are there alternate modes of delivering that kind of education in a way that would be useful to people. Um, and then the other uh, aspect of that project is offering in the park a pop-up VR cinema um, where we previously had several Oculus headsets that we shared uh, with various community members to view the films. Um, and now I think a big question with VR is you can't put something on your nose that uh, other people have used immediately before you in a safe way right now. So how do we uh, offer a similar experience uh, with restrictions there? So we have some time to think those things through and we've been grateful that the Toronto Arts Council has given us sort of an indefinite timeline to work on that project. Um, we would love to be able to say that we have something for the summer to present and share and educate on, but it's just not possible. Similarly, a project called The Right Way with uh, Teatro Dopolavoro, a DLT experience in Toronto, um, was intended to go to the Venice Biennale of Theatre uh, this summer, and that's been canceled forever. <laughs> Postponed until September <laughs> yeah. for the time being. September yeah. until the time being, although that may that may change as well. Yes. So we also um, are not allowed to go anywhere right now uh, outside of Canada, uh, so we can't do it <laughs> uh then so thinking about um international collaborations right now and ian talked a little bit about that with the indigenous futurities project uh finding more creative ways to still engage collaboratively internationally is important to us um and we're still looking forward to trying to figure out how to complete that project um, but that would have a vr component in a live theater performance so there's a lot of layers to unpack there in terms of actually being able to get that work done um, at the moment. So, but those were the were the, uh, the projects that were going on between February and now. Um, but so we're we're so happy that uh, some of them have been able to move forward, and then the other ones, we're just gonna have to be yeah. creative about the timelines. Yeah, when as uh, the big change that we've experienced with uh, Toaster Lab in this project has really um, at the at the time that everything sort of you know mid March when uh, everything started to be modified or closed down, especially around art events and performance spaces, uh, which is where we were attempting to do most of our work. Uh, there was, and we've been lucky um, that uh, the various levels of funding available to us through the Toronto uh, and Canada Council, we currently don't have an active Ontario Arts Council uh, grant going, but that there's been a lot of flexibility and willingness and, and right. attempt by both of these funders to keep the money within the artist's hands um, to help them, allow them to modify the project so that they're able to be accomplished or changed in a way. Part of that was this happened right in the middle of what we were doing in terms of the Atelier project. Uh, and as a result, um, a lot of the projects, as we've I've mentioned, have had to be modified. But at the same time, uh, one of the primary goals of it has been around documentation. It's always something that we had not quite gotten into, uh, gotten all the projects that we've been working on. We've been so focused on the actual projects themselves and building the catalog to document. Um, that we found that this would be an excellent time to work on that documentation, especially because a lot of these projects, and, and as it is also part of our, our hackathon, give different tools towards um, ways of either making places, making content in places 
um, as Adrian was talking about, having like an, a, a, an immersive theater experience that is socially distanced for one within a site-specific context, like, that is something that m we may be able to do sooner in the future or could do now, depending on, on the scenario in which you're working, the types of distance collaboration that we're working on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are um, really useful for artists trying to figure out what's happening. We've seen a large proliferation of either people putting things online to stream or working on doing readings and then full performances through Zoom and using those fun uh, functions. And because so many of the tools that we've been working with and working to make a, a, like make sense of to people who might otherwise not come in as technologists to this to this question, that um, making that information available as soon as possible would be extremely useful. Um, uh, in in our previous conversation, what what I, what I'd like to do now is sort of open up the conversation to our fantastic board who have patiently been listening to our updates. But we were having, like, everybody is doing really exciting work, and I wanted to open up a little bit of a question about what documentation looks like um, around a lot of these projects. Uh, a comment that um, Jacob notes Vicky made uh, earlier on. Uh, especially in regards to his projects, and, and he may uh, be able to comment on them a little bit uh, more in a moment, uh, at least briefly, um, that uh, that uh, the way that we document these things is not about just about writing them up, but also about how one experiences them, the experiential quality to that. So Jacob or otherwise, I would actually open it up to the group to think to start thinking about like how would you communicate to somebody else how you might be able to replicate these things, especially if they're using the types of tools that either you're creating or you're learning or and helping others to learn how to create with. Uh, I'll take the throw and then probably throw it on uh, to the group pretty quickly. Um, in, in my practice, a, a big part of it has been, especially in the dance world, um, trying to understand how how choreographers and creators and producers can provide an authentic experience of, of their work that's mediated. Um, and so that's a, that kind of comes down to a question of like translation slash adaptation, um, but it is possible. It is possible if you, if you uh, engage the same creative team and facilitate that uh, for an, analog or live creative team uh, to produce um, a version of their work or an experience of their work uh, that gives that uh, authentic quality of the live piece. Um, it may look really different, it might sound really different, it might have a totally different format, uh, but how do you convey that, uh, that core, some of that, some of the aura of that experience? Um, and that's what we are talking about now as well. Um, it's just a lot, uh, more frantic and desperate now. <laughs> um, when we talk about documentation, it needs to not just uh, show what, you know, it's not like a performance recording. It needs to show, communicate how it felt to be there. It needs to communicate how the audience experienced it. And uh, it needs to do that across all of the media that the show actually integrates, which gets really challenging because you are creating a multimedia show. How, what is your, what format is your documentation going to be in? Um, I'm going to stop talking now and take and uh, throw the discussion to the group. Yeah, thank you so much, Jacob. Beth, I might actually uh, invite you to to speak a little bit because right now this is something that you are concerned with with um, the on the academic side of your practice, well, on all sides of your practice, but importantly within um, uh, the, the, your current graduate work. Um, yeah, uh, and, and actually within uh, this international mixed reality group that I'm part of with, with Paul Sages as well, where we're um, looking at collaborating, creating and performing in VR and, and our, our conversation actually just recently turned to um, ideas of notebooks and workbooks and disseminating work within VR um, because of the embodied experience that happens within that context. So um, uh, yeah, so my academic work is, is looking at, at VR and I'm right now trying to figure out how to disseminate a project that was both um, 
a live performance and a virtual reality, augmented reality performance. And it's, it's actually incredibly challenging and I have far too many pages written um, about it because it's so hard to figure out how to, how to do exactly what Jacob was saying. How do you express the feeling of what it was to be there? How do you, um, and because it was a mixed reality performance, how do you express even if you rebuild the whole thing in VR so that you could potentially engage with viewing it in VR as a recorded experience, you how do you capture that um, intangible piece of holding a real object and experiencing it in virtual reality at the same time? So trying to grapple with these ephemeral things um, and with recreating that that embodied experience. Um, and we've, we've actually had some really interesting and successful, um, uh, I don't know what you call them. They were, they were moments, they were experiences with each other, uh, talking and, and being in real time in virtual reality uh, with other collaborators and other thinkers and, and, and actually just playing simple games, going on a walk through Dublin together and building memories together. So there was something really key in that uh, virtual embodied experience that I think for, for a lot of this work holds, holds something for a kind of dissemination, that there's an alternate kind of dissemination. Because I, I am certainly in the writing of it, um, which I've experienced something else in the writing of it too that I, I want to touch on. Um, but in the writing of it, it's, it's really, really hard to capture. Uh, and I'm going to have, you know, a figure heavy document and I'm going to have hyperlinks and I'm going to have, I'm going to build some stuff in VR to help it express it. But it's, uh, it's proving really, really challenging. Um, uh, I was thinking about the piece that the, the locator piece at, at PQ about the idea of re-experiencing re and Ian, you'll have to remind me of the name, but the, the piece where you get to re-experience the space. Um, and the idea of potentially re-experiencing a research project through an audio walk of where you were. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's hard and it's interesting going in and digging through old documentation and trying to get a sense of what old, particularly early virtual reality experiences were like. Um, and early mixed reality experiences were like, and how much feels like it's been left out of the very traditional academic documentation. So yeah, uh, I'm excited about this group because I think we're all, we all have very particular ways of thinking about these things too that feel like combined there's some metaverse <laughs> of, of like research dissemination that will exist uh, between all of us. Yeah. I, I... In, in in true branching narrative fashion, uh, I, I sort of want to either give Paul an opportunity because I know that he's part of that research group as well, or and or uh, in in no particular order, also ask Megan a little bit about that because of uh, working with that particularly within a game development context as like leading or uh, leading uh, a game studio at this point as as uh, what like how how what are you seeing as the challenges of documentation there and also what do you think could bridge back over into the types of documentation as we're looking at similar tools within a performance context yeah well like documentation is always a huge part of game design which is hilarious because we spend so much time at the beginning putting everything together making it really pretty and then we put it in a folder and we forget it's there um i think that's pretty common for most people working in tech uh i have never i have joined so many projects at the last minute and they like hand me the game design document and they're like but that's out of date that's out of date that's out of date and i was like so where do i find out what's going on and usually what ends up happening is um They'll tell me to go check their like uh, their uh, their flow board. Um, so if that's like Glow or if that's um, oh man, I can't remember the other names, but 
you go through and you're like, well, yeah, I see all these notes, but a lot of it's like in house context. And I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, I do know a couple of studios have basically created like wikis, um, which would be tied to these, um, I guess, glow charts, glow boards that kind of keep track of like what's going on. Uh, that one I found a little bit more helpful, but at the end of the day, it's like you really do need one staffer where their their entire job is just updating and keeping track of the documentation. Uh, and that's the only way that I've ever really seen it work. Um, so for what, what we do um, is we have our um, project manager is basically in charge of the documentation because he's the one that also has to be talking to everyone and he needs to have that high level. Um, and if anyone new comes in and they have questions, he needs to be able to like answer those. So like in a lot of places, what they do is they give it to a, like a junior developer or designer and they're just like here. And I was like, that doesn't really make sense. Like this actually feels like the role that the manager needs to be taking on because they're the ones that need to kind of know everything they're the ones that need to be able to look at that and say it's out of date. So in terms of documentation, I found actually putting it in the hands of the manager is way more effective than having a student or even a junior like take care of it and then just keep it in a folder somewhere. Um, I think also like the larger your group becomes, the more necessary it is for that documentation to be like well updated. And I know I'm saying things that like everyone already knows. Um, but I think sometimes we, and I, I may be going off base, so also like let me know if you need me to go in a different direction when it comes to documentation. No, I think this is great because I, I had what you're describing to me coming at it from someone with a bit more familiar with media production than necessarily development is like, oh, you need a script supervisor. You need like someone who's dealing with story continuity when you start to develop like a long and complicated uh, narrative across things. Um, that it's like important to have that uh, that that sort of expertise in there. I mean, not to, I know that you just said you can't just hand it to a student, but I did want to <laughs> highlight that we've added uh, uh, someone to our mix who is not just a student, uh, <laughs> but uh, Rachel, who's joining us um, for the time being, who has a, actually a long history in, in this area um, I, I do. In <laughs> fact, I actually spent 15 years uh, working in automated software testing, quality insurance, providing training and consulting to uh, large and small companies all across North America um, using HP what are you now? suite of tools. Now I am a master's student <laughs> <laughs> um, at York. I finally finished my undergrad. Took me six years, but. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I'm now working um, as a master's student at York um, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the digital media program. Um, I will be churning out a geolocated AR application of my own, working with uh, students with disabilities to tell stories um, at uh, York University's Keele campus. Um, so far, that still seems on schedule. Um, but uh, but yeah, so so documentation and the challenges of keeping it up to date and managing it and the communication between all areas and the usefulness of having somebody more senior um, who has responsibility and uh, and familiarity with the process at all levels. Um, definitely, I can I can back you up on that, Megan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I also found it. it uh... Uh, what, what, how to phrase it it was like once you put it in the hands of somebody who had I guess more to do which is not to say like students don't have a lot to do but I guess yeah. um, more to do in terms of making decisions it's uh, authority it's, yeah, it's authority. about power um, and control and yeah and I mean I've like I, I started 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 um as a computer science major looking at going into development my parents were both programmers so like nobody writing code wants to deal with documentation and no, and no. that's you know, that's fine. As theater artists, you know, none of us building a set really want to deal with the, the purchasing problems that are involved in that, right? That's like, that's what management is for. And that's part of the supportive nature of those roles. But, uh, but it really helps to have somebody, it was always easier to do the job as a consultant than it was as a junior member of a staff. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully and I then, can bring a little bit of that to this. Right. And, and like, I feel like people respect the documentation better 
when your manager is the one being like, guys, like I need your info. You got to keep me up to date. And it's supposed to like that poor junior who's like, um, it would be really nice if you could tell me all the changes you've recently made. Yes. (laughs) I've been in that position. It's really nice to be able to look at someone and say, you know, you're paying me $500 to write this for you today, right? Would you like me to sit here and do nothing? Or would you like to give me the information that I need to get this done? And I love all the knowing nods, especially for those. (laughs) I'm enjoying it too. Have loaded (laughs) documentation experience of just being like, yep. Yeah. So. (laughs) It would be great if all of you have Rachel and our wonderful advisory board um like for this next phase so it's really like exciting to think about um now what that documentation can look like for the projects that have already happened or the ones that are going forward too um and then i love the ideas like of looking at expansive ways of p- putting forward those documentations in the world and that it could be its own creative project uh, on its own yeah. too but- that yeah, uh, the a, a question that 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 raises that relates to for me that I sort of had coming into this mm-hmm. uh, was related a little bit to what you were saying, Beth, and and I'd love to especially if uh, Tayan and Patrick have some thoughts on this because I feel like you would is as we're thinking about these future convenings together of moving into a more experiential space. I mean, I think that's one of the limitations of Zoom performance. We're doing a Zoom performance right now. We're performing a meeting. Uh, So, and this is different than we would be if we were doing it uh, in person, even when we've been streaming that, it's been a critical conversation, especially when we were in Vancouver around like, who is this audience for? for? So I might, I might, uh, uh, Patrick, both as having or have been co-organizer for that and someone who's thinking about sonography and VR and uh, tie in, especially with regards to like beta space and the different types of equipment that you're making available to like figure out how to use in different ways. I wonder if, if either of you had some thoughts towards how we might con- convene in the future, um, maybe if we do another if we do another symposium as a virtual symposium how does it actually become a symposium and not just uh, a webinar um i am going to defer to answer that only because i'm getting every fifth word at this point oh, no. that's why i've killed the video and i'm i'm so sorry i'm trying to keep up but um, I'm not even sure what you really asked, but I think it was about how do we make sure the user experience stays at the forefront of this, um, which I am not going to answer at the moment again because I bad connection. Sorry. It's part of the reality. This is our, that you're having a true mixed reality. <laughs> Diane. All right. Um, some ideas that we're looking at in cinema and media arts. Uh, at, you know, moving all our courses online, we've been looking at different uh, VR platforms where we're that sort of replicate bodies in a space. So something like Mozilla Hubs, um, or uh, I just had a tour of Adaptica, which is they're doing like these, these big campuses uh, with different like rooms that you can just walk to and see different things. So that might be a, an interesting thing to look at. Um, and then another idea is maybe just to set up a bunch of different spaces that are uh, physically distant and then have like a sort of mixed um, experience that way. So like maybe three of us could go into beta space and look at how things are set up there and then maybe broadcast from there and connect beta space with another space, uh, maybe like at UBC. And so we can have like a bunch of maybe different virtual spaces that might replicate uh, this kind of spatial connection uh, differently than simply on Zoom. I get that would be my um, approach, I guess, to, to right. look into. Yeah, I mean, we're sort of, everybody went quickly to Zoom because it was there and we mm-hmm. we had a bunch of things on our calendar that we still had to talk about. So we used an available tool that seemed to solve that need, um, but doesn't necessarily replicate the experience. As the uh, as the as the I farthest could, away. Could, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I would I would just say that you know a, a lot of the questions also revolve around accessibility, um, and uh, we're f- like we're finding right now, especially as we explore virtual spaces for conferences or for just creative work, um, it really really leaves out some people and really includes others, and, and this is always the case with technologies. Um, 
So it, it's one of those tricky situations. I find I'm out in rural Ontario, <laughs> you know, it's still Ontario and I can't get a really good bandwidth to use a you know, stable video connection, let alone, you know, go into NEOS VR or whatever and, and have that kind of experiential uh, quality. So, yeah, so I think the questions are, are huge and, and I think there's lots of permutations though to it, to how to make it accessible at the same time. And as long as people are thinking, you know, around how inclusion might function, then at least the dialogue is open in, in that regard. Um, and I also just wanted to, and I don't know if we have time, but I wanted to circle back a little bit to the documentation question. Maybe you didn't, maybe you want to move on, Ian, I, I don't know. No, 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 please. Well, I, I guess from from my from my perspective, again, thinking about a few of these things that um, that perhaps it's uh, for the group um, coming up to determine what the aims of the documentation might be. Um, so there, there's sort of things that, you know, we're thinking about from a practitioner standpoint or, or creator standpoint, but perhaps we're thinking about, you know, developers in that mix that are more technically minded or academics, for example, a lot of us are going to be thinking theoretically about, um, about this work. And, and certainly that crosses over into funding bodies or funders. So I think that the aims of the documentation are, are really important to think about as a group, because of course it's difficult to do everything, um, but we'll all have a sort of vested interest in a different mode. Um, and then I also think about the multi multifaceted ways in which the documentation can be presented as everybody's already touched up upon today and how we really communicate embodied performative live experiences um, that branch into things like software, video, or virtual whiteboarding, or these wiki pages, um, or how things are downloadable or replayable. So this idea of, you know, can we, can we go on those walks again individually, um, you know, can, can funders and, and uh, uh, academics go on those journeys, um, uh, you know, and that leaves out part of the other conversation, which is the communitas aspects of, of theatrical um, play. And then I, I guess finally, I, I would I would also think a little bit in terms of the broader thematics around the documentation, and that might be uh, things that are more specifically um, tailored to experience um, of the of the particular case studies or how the documentation might split or splay into different case studies that explore different thematic areas. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, along the lines of things like. Um, embodiment or presence, um, immersion or liveness, these more theoretical um, angles that might complement the work as, as well as, of course, the principles behind the technology. So how the nuts and bolts of making things happen and what kinds of softwares have been evolved or creatively developed um, uniquely and the fast pace of technologies and how we all seek, and I think this might be common to a lot of us, that as theater practitioners, as scenographers, designers, we are always uh, we're, we're working generally with not not the largest budgets, but we're always trying to do something that the technology does not allow us to innately let us do and to try and break it in some way. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think it's that that's a, another kind of angle in which we, we sort of think outside of some of these, you know, very typical development paradigms in terms of UI that that um, that lend itself well to kind of another thematic area of documentation. So. I, I just thought I wanted to put out those sort of um, those, those kinds of things that I've been thinking about in terms of how one goes about with this huge group to um, yeah think about what what it looks like and where it looks like going. That's that's, that's very helpful. Yeah, we are. I'm. Uh, we're, we're at time for for our stream. So before we get kicked off of there, um, I did want to. The only person we haven't heard from is uh, the person who is farthest away from us. Physically, and I just wondered if you wanted to sign us to us in our hearts. Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, would you like to sign us off? Uh... As soon as I can find the unmute button, there we go. There you go. Um, <laughs> sure. I um. Wow. So this meeting was fantastic. Um, I really appreciate hearing from all of you, and I I sincerely mean that. I really appreciate hearing from all of you. And I think it's super important, especially now, especially with the world and the state that it's in, that we find a way to forge these connections. Um, I think Paul said it really, really well, kind of in spite of the technology and in spite of the limitations and in spite of the current state of affairs and in spite of the fact that theater is not 
you know, we'll see when that happens again, live theater as we know it. Um, all of that said, yeah, these, so these project updates are fantastic. Um, I'm super looking forward to working with everybody as we go forward. I find myself, I think because of the physical distance, I'm in that weird category that Paul was saying about uh, being both more included now, uh, because essentially I, I exist uh, remotely on East Coast time, but I've suddenly found all of these events and things that I have been missing are now online. So I've been attending, like I've attended more live events in the last three months than I think I did in the previous year, um, which is really weird. Uh, so anyway, um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I think that we're, we're moving, this is the right group, I think, to move into a really interesting phase in, in kind of human connection across this. And I hope that we keep forging our ways through that. The only specific comment I have with regards to the technology is that I will say, even as someone who builds the tech, that the only mistake I think we can make is to select only one. That the way that this tends to happen is that the, uh, the online representation is really always a limited, by definition, it's a limitation on what we can do in person. So if you try to pick a single platform, you end up kind of automatically limiting it for somebody or some, some subset. But if we don't do that, and instead we just focus on what we're trying to do, uh, which I think we're all on the same page with, which is creating tr a real experience and a real connection. I think that we'll we'll do okay. We'll find our way through this. So I don't know. There's my benediction for you, Ian. Yeah, yeah thank that, you. That's <laughs> and you are all close in our hearts too. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you all for for joining us. I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye to our live stream now. If um, you don't have to run away right now, um, you can if you want. It's the time that you picked, but I'm going to stop our feed for the time being. Thank you to everybody who joined us uh, from.